part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hi, everyone. Thanks for stopping by the Sable Brothers on the Baseline Podcast, all part of the Press Play Podcast Network. We are your hosts, John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And thank you for subscribing on iTunes and Spotify. And we've got a uh, tremendous guest here, uh, one that's been, well, Browns fans, you know him all too well, future oh, yeah. NFL Hall of Famer, Scott, uh, a six-time first-team All-Pro, 10-time Pro Bowler, played an NFL record 10,000. 363 consecutive snaps. Our guests, of course, that kind of gave it away. Legendary Browns <laughs> offensive tackle, Joe Thomas. Joe, thanks for coming on, man. How you been? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on. Joe, I say future Hall of Famer, but this time next year, you might just be in Canton with your gold jacket and bronze bust. Has that kind of like, I know the voting hasn't happened, but has that kind of sunk in? Have you thought yeah, about it? Uh, uh, you know, people want to ask me about it and they want to talk about it. And I'm not somebody that believes in jinxes. So it's not that I'm anti-talking about it because I'm worried about, you know, what will happen with the voting process and things like that, because the hay's in the barn on this stuff, right? You know, there's nothing I'm going to do now that's going to change my status uh, and qualifications as a potential NFL Hall of Famer. But that's a long way away still. I mean, we're a ways away from even narrowing it down to finalists. And um, I'm sure I'll think about it a little bit more as we get closer, but I'm just more excited thinking about the Browns season, which is opening here right around the corner. Absolutely. And congratulations on being named to the Browns Legends program. You'll be honored at halftime during the home opener. What does that honor mean to you? Well, it's really special because it puts you in an elite class of NFL players. I think when you look at alumni groups and the most special groups of great NFL players from one team, certainly the Browns has got to be up there when you put them up against like the likes of where I grew up with the Packers and the Bears and some of the original NFL franchises, even the Steelers. I know it's hard for Browns fans and players alike to admit, but there's been a lot of great players in those different organizations. And certainly I think to become one of the Browns legends puts you in a class with a lot of the players whose names are synonymous with the building of this league. You know, Joe, let's go back to the very beginning on draft night in 2007. Ever since I watched this, I've always been dying to ask you about this. And I know you've been asked about this thousands of times in the last 15 years, but you decided to ditch the draft at NYC to, to go fishing with your dad. Uh, unconventional, but amazing at the same time. How did that idea come about? Yeah, it's funny because, um, the way we're answering the question, it was like it was some type of plan. Really what it was, was I was no, no nowhere near interested in buying a suit and going to sweaty New York City, shaking hands with a bunch of people that I didn't know on draft day and having cameras stuck in my face. And I just wanted to do what I did on pretty much every Saturday growing up in the summer. And that was go fishing with my dad on Lake Michigan. Like there was no options in my mind of what I was going to do on that day. It was so simple because one, I despised having the attention as an offensive lineman, especially. And I certainly didn't want to go hang out with people that I didn't know. And the other option was to hang out with my dad and uh, a couple buddies and go fishing and enjoy the day, which really was going to be the last chance before you start like the craziness of your rookie season in the NFL with OTAs and mini camps and the busyness of those things. It was my last chance to really hang out and just kind of be a normal person. So um, I just kind of told the NFL, thank you for, the invite uh it means a lot because i think they were inviting about five guys at the time and it was special and i felt great that they invited me that means that they thought i was going to be one of the top five players picked but i'm gonna politely decline uh you guys can maybe find somebody else i would much rather hang out with my dad that day and um it kind of became a thing because i think i was the first person to sort of decide that they had better things to do on draft day uh but also the nfl kind of pushed back i think they were surprised that I was not interested in being part of their uh, multi-million dollar circus that day. And I'd rather just kind of be anonymous. Like it wasn't important to me to build a brand or like have the cameras in front of my face and, you know, have an opportunity to introduce myself to NFL fans. I'm like, guys, I'm a lineman. I don't care what I do. Nobody's going to care more about me than the 32nd quarterback in the NFL. So I'd rather just do something that I love on that day and spend the time with my dad. 
So you played for the Browns from 07 to 2017. And as we know, there were, there were a lot of losing seasons there, but your rookie year, I mean, you know, the Browns went 10 and six, you know, coming out NFL rookie year, 10 and six at that point, did you think at that point, I know hindsight's a little different, but that, Hey, this is going to be the beginning of something special. Hey, we might 2008, 2009, you know, the progress, did you think there would be a progression there? I did. I, I, I had a pretty successful college career. We weren't like Ohio state, you know, we weren't winning national champions championships, but I think my senior year, we were 12 and one year before that. I don't know. We were 11 and two or three. Like, so we were really successful when I was at Wisconsin and, and throughout my college career, I think we started out, you know, like eight wins. Then we got to nine wins and we got 10 or 11 and then 12. So there was a nice progression, you know, as, the players kind of bought in a little bit more and some of the younger players were playing a little bit more and just my own career. I felt like I had a lot of influence over the success or failure of the team. And we got better throughout my career. So I just kind of assumed, Hey, yeah, this is how the NFL works. Like, all right, 10 and six this year, that's kind of where we start. Like that's the floor. We've kind of set what the standard is. And then every year we'll probably get a little bit better. And maybe next year, you know, we'll be competing for uh, certainly an AFC North championship, probably in the playoffs and the Super Bowl. And I just had, no appreciation for how hard it is, I think, to win in the NFL because we brought back largely the same team in year two in 2008, but the results were not exactly the same. I think we ended up four and 12 or five and 11, ended up firing the coach and the general manager. And that was quickly like my 17th welcome to the NFL moment when going into the last game of the season my in my second year, I was like, oh no, they're, they're definitely not going to fire the coaches and the GM and basically clean house. Like, we were 10 and six last year and they, I think they just gave everybody an extension. I'm like, Oh, that's not going to happen. They're they're not that short-sighted. Like this is a good group. We can win with this group. And of course I was pretty wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong actually with that thought process because that ended up happening a bunch of times throughout my career, including when Rob Chudzinski was there, he only made it one year. didn't even make it a full 12 Mm -hmm. months as a head coach because in the NFL, it's a, what have you done for me lately business? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times uh, ownership and management is, happy to just clean house and start over again if they feel that the direction is not headed uh, with the same idea that they have exactly. So how do you stay motivated? I mean, your rookie year, you know, you're kind of rough around the edges. Like you just said, you're a little naive going in and here we go. Year two, year three, year four. How do you stay motivated when you see these changes and the progression isn't exactly what you anticipated? It can be a little bit difficult, but I think that's one of the very few things you can learn from being part of a team that loses a lot Mm -hmm. is it's really important to understand, like, what are the things that I can control? Like, literally, what can I go to work every day and focus on where I don't lose sight of what my job is? Because in the end, and this is this came from Belichick, which came from Parcells, which he probably stole from somebody else and then Paul Paul Brown he probably stole it from some general in the 1900s like to be the best teammate you can be means you're the best at what you do and you don't worry about things that you don't control so as a left tackle it was easy after understanding like I was getting better as a player but my team was getting worse to realize that I have to focus every single day on being as good as I possibly can because that's what I can do to be a great teammate and there's obviously synergy that happens with teamwork and the camaraderie of the locker room. But in the end, if I worry about what my quarterback is doing because he's not doing the right things, then it's going to hurt my own performance, which in the end will hurt the team's performance. So yeah, if somebody's not doing the right thing, you need to encourage them and find a way to motivate them. But in the end, you can't have the idea and the mindset that, ah, my quarterback's not playing very well today. So I'm going to worry about that instead of, spending that mental energy focusing on my own job Mm -hmm. to try to be as good as I can possibly be. So Joe, following the Browns, like Scott and I have, and I know you've had this question asked to you quite a bit. I mean, you've blocked and snapped the ball for what? I think 20 different quarterbacks with the Browns in in your uh, 10 year career with them. 20 some starters. And I think it was more than that for guys that just came in and took a few snaps at quarterback, like Terrell Pryor, took some snaps at quarterback one year. And I think Charlie Whitehurst, the old touchdown Jesus, he took some snaps at quarterback, although they didn't start. But either way, the point is there's a lot of quarterbacks back there. Could you name them all? Do you know them? No. I I've <laughs> tried to do this a few times. I actually did it for an ESPN story at one point, and it took me like 10 minutes to try to think of all of them because – I can remember the the early ones and I can remember the late ones, but like the middle of my career 
we had three or four different quarterbacks almost every single season Mm -hmm. and no disrespect to those guys intentionally, but it's hard to remember all of them on the spot, especially because I'm an offensive lineman and we're not the smartest people on the team. Yeah, there was one year, I have the list here, but we don't need to go through them. But I remember <laughs> one year you had Derek Anderson, Ken Dorsey, Brady Quinn, and Bruce Kadkowski. Mm-hmm. I think that was the most you had at four in a regular season. It and seemed like different... three was a really common number. Like it just about every year was, it seemed like there was three guys that played. Another year you had Brandon Whedon, Thaddeus Lewis, Colt McCoy, and Josh Johnson. There you go. Know. It, wow. It's just incredible the amount. That's got to be an NFL record. I don't know if they've ever tracked that, but it's, it's <laughs> you know, hey, speaking of um, quarterbacks that you snap to, can you tell us maybe an unknown, you know, podcast friendly story for the kids listening at mm-hmm. home involving mm-hmm. Johnny Manziel? Oh, I don't know if there is any. Uh, all I can say about Johnny <laughs> is he was a great teammate uh, from a friend standpoint, like very nice person. Uh, but he was not a great teammate from a commitment standpoint. Mm -hmm. Like I think everybody in the locker room really liked him as a person. He was very nice to people. He treated people the right way. Um, But unfortunately he didn't treat his career the right way. Like he didn't have that level of commitment from the start. And I think it was kind of probably pretty apparent when you heard the stories of him in college, getting away with everything, like missing meetings and workouts and like the late nights and just not focusing on his career. But when you're such a gifted and talented athlete, like he is, he could easily just coast through college football because he was just so much better than everybody. And so he didn't really have to commit and sacrifice to be great. And I think that mentality, that attitude carried over to the NFL where he just kind of had that perspective. "Ah, I'll just show up and kind of do my thing and we'll figure it out. Like there wasn't that commitment that you have to have to be great at the NFL game. And I think it was just too late by the time he realized it, Mm but um I mean, he, he was interesting because uh, you just never knew when he was going to show up and what version of Johnny was going to show up, depending <laughs> on how many of his buddies were in town and how late the night was the night before. Wow. And we will have more from Joe Thomas right after this. The r r Podcast going to be rocking and rolling with you because football season is underway. College, Ohio State, the Power Fives, the Mac, the Browns. Michael Regai, are you ready to rock and roll with some football? Kenny, I've been ready. This is our time of year. This is what r r is all about. We're going to be with you every week. Kenny just said it, Browns, NFL, Ohio State-centric. So you got to stay with us all fall and winter long here on r r that's right, the Red Eye and Rhoda podcast coming to you here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe now and don't miss a show. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Hey, I'm Jason. And I'm Gary. And and we we love ball cards. And if you love ball cards too, good news. You just found your new favorite podcast. From breaks to grading. And from collecting to flipping, join us on the Ball Card Show. The sports podcast for the sports collector. So what was your weekly routine during the season? You know, game on Sunday start us on Monday. You know, I, I played baseball. So, you know, we always had a routine Monday through you know, throughout the week, but football's different. What was your routine starting the day after a game and then taking us into the following season? And did you eat anything special before a game? Yeah. So the routine was, was very strict, like, and regimented. And I think mm-hmm. you talk to a lot of guys that played in the NFL for a while, they become like these immense creatures of habit because Unlike the other sports, you only play one game a week mostly, and it's usually on Sunday, so it's the same day. So you have this rhythm of the week. It's almost similar to like as a parent, you know, I compare it to being a parent. I got four kids. They're all in school. And like you have this rhythm of the year where, you know, they go back to school around Labor Day Mm -hmm. and then they got their Christmas break and then they got Easter break and they're done around Memorial Day. And then you got your summer. So you kind of get into that rhythm and that flow. And it's the same thing with the NFL. You play on Sunday, usually come in Monday and you do a little bit of a shakeout workout. 
you come in, you watch the film. A lot of times you go on the field, you go through corrections from the game. You go back and you'll start maybe watching some film for the next opponent. You come back on Tuesday if you're injured or you want to get a little bit of extra work and you do your rehab. But mostly Tuesdays are kind of the day off for players. Wednesday you come in and Wednesday and Thursday are your busy work days where you're installing all of your concepts for the week. Um, so Wednesday is usually more first and second down. Uh, Thursday is usually third down and then special situations. And then Friday, you'll do a few more of the special situations. Sometimes that'll be like red zone goal line backed up four minute, two minute offense, things like that. And then you'll kind of polish things up. A lot of times you'll take what you did well from Wednesday and Thursday, and you'll kind of reinforce them on Friday. And then the coaches will also look at some of the plays that are new that they didn't really like. And then they'll, they'll kind of chop them. They'll put them on the chopping block and then you're not practicing them on Friday. And then Saturday is really kind of um, a, a quick jog through where you're getting on the field, you're going over your openers, which are usually the first 15 plays on offense that are scripted. So you kind of get an idea of, all right, this is our personnel grouping. This is the formation. This is the shift. This is what we expect the defense to do when we do that. And they'll put a defense out there. Usually it'll just be your own offensive players wearing defensive jerseys and just kind of standing there walking through with you. Um, so you get an idea of what the calls are on the offensive line, maybe what the coverage is that you expect to see in the secondary for the quarterback and the receivers. Um, and you're just kind of going through the motions of what the game we expect it to look like on Sunday, at least sort of the beginning of the game and then kind of the next favorite calls from that offensive coordinator. So a lot of times, even though you say, hey, it's only the first 15 uh, plays that you're going to walk through. And then it's going to be maybe another 35 or 40 plays, which the coordinator and a lot of times the quarterback have taken the whole call sheet and they've kind of narrowed it down to maybe their top favorite 60 plays that they expect to see in the game, which typically in NFL games around 60 or 70 plays. So they're basically trying to give you a look at everything you're going to see in that game, because if you know anything about the brain, like your, your brain doesn't really know the difference of full speed versus walkthrough speed. Mm -hmm. So getting a walkthrough rep, or even just closing your eyes and visualizing your brain is getting the rep just the same way as it would if it was doing it full speed. So bringing that muscle memory and that, that uh, uh, in, in ability to ingrain what you're going to do in your head on a Saturday or a Saturday night before a Sunday game is incredibly valuable. And I think it's one thing that NFL does really well that I'm sure other leagues do it, but I think they could even do it a little bit more to help success on game day. Joe, how many carbs did you eat in a week or a day when you were playing, being an offensive mm, lineman? A lot, a lot. All carbs, actually. I, I, it was funny. I had a, uh, a buddy this morning who I work out with. We were talking about diet and nutrition and other boring stuff. And I said, do you know the only place on planet Earth where carbs and fat are found naturally together is in breast milk? And the, the reason that's found in breast milk is to help you gain fat for your ability to grow into a human when you're down the line. And so as humans, now we put those things together because they taste really good when they're together, but they really make you gain a lot of weight. And so when you're an offensive lineman, like I was, who was trying to gain that weight, that was like my Bible, my gospel was, I was probably eating, I don't know, five or 7,000 calories a day, depending on the the day. Like obviously training camp, when you're practicing two times a day for three hours, you may be even over seven, you know, who knows how many calories. It's basically, you're just going into the lunchroom and I'm, I'm filling up two plates as high as I can with as many carbs and sugars as I possibly can. And then I'm going to eat until I feel like I'm sick. And then I'm going to go do it again because I need all those, those calories and all that energy. Um, but as far as like the specific number of carbs, hard to say, I do know that during the season, just to maintain my weight, I would eat like a big dinner, obviously. Um, and then after dinner, my wife and I would usually watch some TV or just kind of wind down and I'd go downstairs and I'd always get like a pint of ice cream and then a sleeve <laughs> of thin mint, uh, thin mint Girl Scout cookies. And then sometimes I'd wash it down with like a big glass of whole milk, or oh. I would even go with like a protein, like a casein protein, which is a little slower acting protein mm -hmm. shake before bed, just so I could like kind of keep that weight on because it was so difficult. And actually I was burning so many calories. My wife, she, who's a great cook, she would always cook for us during the week. And one time she made a stir fry, which if anybody knows, like you can make a big stir fry, but mm -hmm. because of all the vegetables and stuff, it doesn't have a lot of calories. Right. And usually if it's 
veggies and protein, like a chicken or a beef stir fry, there's not a lot of carbs in there. And me knowing not a whole lot about diet during my career, other than I have to eat a lot of carbs until I feel like I'm sick. Like I got like physically upset at her. I'm like, babe, stir fry. Are you kidding me? Like I'm going to get fired from my job. My coach is going to be on my ass. Like you can't make these meals. I need like lasagna and I fettuccine Alfredo and garlic bread. Like I I have to have carbs. And she was so upset. Like she didn't quite get it. She thought that just making a big meal is all I needed. I'm like, right. right. I need the sugar. Oh, that's great. Well, then all of a sudden you fast forward. Now you retire (laughs) and you know, you went through a metamorphosis. Uh, Was that something that you decided to do right out of the gate you needed you wanted to lose that weight Mm -hmm. and how many pounds did you lose and how long did it take you to do it so I'm normally I would say my body set point should be around 250 that's where I was when I was 18 when I graduated high school gained a lot of weight in college obviously to be an offensive lineman and so I always had that idea like when I was done playing football I wanted to get a little bit closer to my set weight just for general health and wellness long term Mm -hmm. but as I got closer to the end of my career, I dealt with a lot of like arthritis in my back and my knees and my hips and had to do a lot of scopes and take cartilage out and stuff. And the doctor said like, look, there's really nothing more we can do, especially with your left knee other than a knee replacement, because you don't really have any cartilage left and you have Mm -hmm. like a lot of pain. Um, Obviously football not playing is going to be helpful because that beats your body pretty good. But he's like, the number one thing you can do outside of that is lose weight and the number two thing you can do is start eating better because food is inflammatory but depending on what you eat it can be medicine or it can be it can hurt you and be mm-hmm. inflammatory so i was like all right I, I just need to dive into this because i was in a lot of pain and i also had a lot of free time because i didn't practice a whole lot my last <laughs> few years in cleveland and so i just basically became best friends with the nutritionist of the browns and i just started asking her a gazillion questions katie miasic who's awesome nutritionist for the browns and I started doing a lot of reading and, and I really got interested in, all right, once I do decide to retire, how do I lose this weight? Cause I also knew that watching a lot of my other friends who were linemen, if you didn't lose that weight right after you retired, it seemed like you would go the other way because you get into that routine of whatever retired life looks like. And it can pretty easily be the same routine that you had when you were playing. Although when you were playing, you were burning 4,000 or 5,000 calories a day. And in retirement, I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're an Ironman triathlete, you're not going to burn as many calories as you did when you were playing in the NFL because it's so physically taxing. So I knew that a, I wanted to lose weight and I had to eat better for long-term health and wellness, but also I knew that I needed to do it right away or it wasn't going to happen. So I became super motivated that first, like six or nine months after I retired. What are your current workouts like like now? Obviously it's probably different, Mm -hmm. but what do you do now? So things that I love to do for workouts, I still like to lift weights. There's Mm -hmm. a group of like 15 former Badgers that all live in the Madison area. And we get together Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, like 5.30 in the morning before the kids are awake, before people have excuses about, oh, I got a meeting or I got to do this or that. I'm like, no, nobody's got a 5.30 a.m. meeting. You don't have any excuses. Get your butt here three days a week. That's a good start. And then I also, I love yoga. I really fell in love with it. My third year in the NFL, Eric Mangini was our head coach and he forced all of us to do yoga. And at the first I didn't really like it, but then I started understanding the benefits of the mind muscle connection, like starting to understand how your brain can control the firing of all like the small muscles. But then I also started understanding the improvement in mobility and how that helped me avoid injuries. But then I realized too, that like the way that yoga connects your breath to your movement can be a huge help on the football field, not only with understanding how to like brace your your core when you're dealing with like bull rush and you're trying to move people off the off the ball and building that core strength but also your ability to kind of control your mind which i think was one of the things that you're seeing a lot of professional athletes talk about now but i had a big advantage because i was one of like the first guys in the nfl that i feel like was able to kind of really get the benefit and the understanding of how important controlling your mind and your emotions and your breath on the sidelines is for having that focus and ability to repeat your job over and over again. Cause as an offensive lineman, our job is judged not by how many good plays we have, but by how many bad plays we Mm -hmm. have. So the focus on repeatability of pass sets and technique is so important for what I do. And I really give 
yoga and breathing that I learned through the yoga practice, a ton of credit for being able to teach that and also understand like, look, we may be down by 30, but I still got to do my job and I got to focus and be just as good at what I'm doing right now as I am if it's third and 10 and we're in their opponent's red zone and the Heinz red zone uh, in Pittsburgh and it's a tie game and we need three points. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't matter the situation. I got to be the same guy every day and I can't get wrapped up in the emotional like scoreboard or what the quarterback's doing or what drama is happening on the sidelines. I got to focus on me and breath helps like bring your mind back to those things. I'm sure that's helped you now too, even outside of football. Absolutely. And I try as a dad, like, uh, of course I'm feeling, but I'm trying to get my kids to like understand when they're getting just so emotionally heightened that they can't control what they're saying or what they're doing with their body and trying to bring everything back to like, Hey, breath is okay. Like take mm -hmm. a couple deep breaths, like control your breath, start thinking about it. Like think about the little things in your body and your little movements. And it really helps because you can control your mind. Like don't let your mind control you. And I think that for all athletes, really for all people, that's like a message that a lot of times people don't want to receive because they don't want to think that they can control their mm -hmm. emotions, but you really can. And I think that's a good thing to be able to at least first recognize that I'm getting either way too emotional in one direction or the other, and then understand like, Hey, these are the simple things that I can do to get that back under control, to be the person that I want to be mm -hmm. again and not let myself fly off the handle. You know, I love yoga, Joe. I think it's very relaxing and it's, it, it's good for your, your body, your mind, your soul. Scott, on the other hand, um, had a oh, bad run in with, with yoga. Oh, oh, hey, so that's a different story. That's only because <laughs> my wife and I went on a cruise for our 15th wedding anniversary and she's like, come on to yoga. Well, I had eaten and then the boat Ooh. started turning and uh, yoga, you, you know where this is going. They, so it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yoga, food and a rocking boat are not. Yeah, probably not a good, go together not a good basket. Sorry, Scott, I had to bring that up. I know you did. So, Joe, real quick here. Um, you know, one of your old teammates, Phil Dawson, came on the podcast back in the spring. And um, I don't know how often you talk to Phil, but he wanted us to share a message with you about your uh, body transformation. And he's not too happy with you, with your body transformation. So uh, let me play you a little clip, his little message to you real quick. Okay. I need y'all to do me a favor. When y'all see Joe Thomas, I need y'all to tell him I'm really mad at him because we're all supposed to get saggy and soft and fat in retirement. And Joe looks better now than he did as a player so he, yeah, he he's making my wife's seeing that as well by the way <laughs> you see joe on tv looking all in in shape and awesome and all this and then she's looking across the couch while i got my hand down a bag of cheetos and she's looking at that slob over there like what happened to you so please pass that along to joe that he and i got some beef together well he's got some beef with you joe do you want to rebuttal that to phil yeah, Phil, you're welcome. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I'm causing strife in your marriage due to my uh, newfound commitment to health, but that's the benefit of being an offensive lineman. Like, there's nowhere but up to go from a career as an offensive lineman when, you know, you're a kicker, you're a receiver, you're a running back, you're going to be in the best shape of your life when you're a pro athlete. And there's really no way to be able to maintain that throughout your career. So you should have been a lineman, Phil. You should have stuck with what he did in high school. I don't know if you guys know, but he was actually a high school offensive lineman. He played no like the old like uh, wing T where they just line up in a four point stance and they cut everybody like mm -hmm. Navy almost. <laughs> and uh, I remember Phil, Yeah, he was the left tackle on his high school team would always give us good tips on what we need to be doing out there on the field, you know, from his, uh, his perch over there after he was hitting golf balls during practice, he'd have to, have to come over and give us his impression and uh, the tips on playing offensive line. That's yeah. He told fun. us that he got into kicking by accident. <laughs> so my son, Nathan plays offensive line. He's a senior at Medina high school here. What advice would you give him and any young offensive lineman at any level in high school? Mm. Yeah. Uh, basic advice would just be to kind of work on your core strength, because if you think about what you're doing as a lineman, you're basically trying to connect your hands, your shoulder pads, your helmet, which is what you're using to block and move people uh, to the ground. And it comes through the core in your body and into your feet. And so having great balance and great core strength, I think are the most important things to be in a successful offensive lineman. But um, from a general standpoint, I think just 
get really good at the things that other people are not willing to do because football as an offensive lineman, not always the most fun. You're not catching touchdowns. You're not sacking the quarterback. You're not getting interceptions. The crowd's never cheering for you. So you got to be able to appreciate the hard work, the, like the dedication to your craft and the society that being part of an offensive lineman, Mm -hmm. offensive line creates with other guys that are going through the misery that it takes to become a great offensive lineman. Cause going out and hitting the seven man sled and going through the shoots and run blocking in nine on seven, those are not really fun things to do all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think the satisfaction is the group that you form on that offensive line is going to be the tightest group, no matter where you go the rest of your life. Some of my best friends are still guys that I played with on the offensive line in Cleveland. So your last, or was that the, your last game and you tore, was it your bicep or your tricep? Tricep tore, tendon, your yeah. tricep. How long did it take for you to recover from that? Knowing that that was probably it for you mm-hmm. and you were done with football. How long, I mean, is it, is it a hundred percent now? What's yeah. the status of that? So my tricep, not a hundred percent now, but it's fine for normal life. Like I notice a little bit when I try to golf, cause it's my left arm. So I can't really straighten it all the way. I would mm-hmm. say strength level, probably 95%. Probably 90% of my ability to straighten it compared to my other arm. And I think that's just the nature of when you tear a tendon. Like it takes a long time to get that strength back because you lose a ton of muscle mass. And uh, also, I think you lose that range of motion because there's just a lot of scar tissue. There's a lot of damage when they, first of all, when you tore your tricep tendon, and then when they go back in and they sew it or bolt it back into your, uh, your uh, elbow, it's, just never going to be the same. And, you know, I work on it all the time, but eh, mm-hmm. my golf game didn't get any better or worse. So I guess I'm not too bad, too mad about it. It's all right, Joe. Our golf games are, are bad too. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a couple more questions about current Browns and a little rapid fire, then we'll let you go. Right. Um, I know when you and I talked at training camp, the Deshaun Watson suspension was six games. It has since obviously been uh, elevated to 11 games. Do you think the Browns can still make the playoffs um, and do you think Jacoby Brissett will still be able to get, guide them to above a 500 record after 11 games? I do, because I think that their defense is a top five defense. It showed last season they finished top five in total defense. I think they're a better defense than they were last year. So I expect that the defense can really carry this team. Uh, they've got probably the best rushing attack in the NFL. That plays really well. And when you look at what Jacoby Brissett does really well. Like he complements a good defense and a good running game with how he plays because he's really smart with the football. He doesn't turn it over. He hits his tight ends and his running backs a lot in the passing game. And he's able to really play that ball control football. So I think it plays well. Also their schedule is a little bit easier at the beginning of the season than it is at the end. And so I think for fans, if, if you're sitting there and you're at six and five, when Deshaun comes back, you should feel really good about your chances because I think you're going to make the playoffs. Is that something you look at as the schedule right about this time of the year? You go, okay, look at this. It might be, or do you treat every team the same? I know it sounds like a dumb as a fan or as a player, as, 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 as a player, as a, as a player, or do you look at every? Yeah. At, what do you do? I mean, as a player, you're looking at things one game at a time. Like okay. when the schedule comes out in May, you look at the whole thing, obviously. Mm-hmm. And for me, everybody's got their own reason why they're cheering for little nuances in the schedule. For me, I was always cheering against games on turf and against games that are hot at the beginning of the season because the hot games are just so miserable as a lineman because you just you're so big and you sweat so much. Like, so you don't want to play in Florida, mm-hmm. you don't want to play in Houston at the beginning of the season, you don't want to play in Carolina. Like, those are games that you don't want to see on the calendar at the beginning of the season. You love to see them at the end of the year, but uh, the other thing is like the turf field turf even as good as it is now it just takes a bigger chunk out of your body during the Mm -hmm. season when you play on it versus natural grass and I knew that my recovery between a turf game and the next game was going to be a lot harder and I was going to be in a lot more pain with a lot more swelling and it was going to hinder my performance the next week more than if I would play on grass so I was always looking at those turf games and I definitely didn't want to see like back-to-back turf games. Cincinnati had one of the hardest turfs in the NFL when I was playing. And so I hated going down there. I always wanted to see what point of the year that was going to be like having a bye week after that was always really nice. So you could kind of give your knees and your back a little bit more time to recover before the next game. 
outside of covering football for the Browns on the NFL Network, being with family and working out, I know you like to smoke a lot of meat, and that's something mm. that my brother has done a lot, right? Mm-hmm. And I've, I've, I've tried to do some of that, and I know my brother's a lot better at it than me. Do you have a favorite meat to smoke? Mm. And what's your favorite cut of steak? Yeah, my favorite cut of steak um, is actually a skirt steak. I, I do a skirt steak as an appetizer. Like if we're having friends over, that's kind of my go-to. So I'll, I'll do a skirt steak in the sous vide. I think I do 145 for like mm. eight hours, get it really nice and tender. And then I use this um, Jamaican jerk seasoning blend that I put on top. It's by Island Time. It's really good. It's got some sugar in there. So it goes really well with the fattiness of the skirt steak. And so after I sous vide it, I'll throw it on the grill, like super hot for like a minute on both sides, just to get a little bit of chard and to caramelize some of those sugars. And then you just slice it against the grain and it's an awesome appetizer. It'd be great as a fajita, like on a taco. Um, but that's, that's a go-to that's something that's unique, I think. So that's kind of why I like to make it when people come over because everyone can just try a little bite, no matter what the main is, and they can really enjoy themselves and be like, I've never had skirt steak. I've never had Jamaican jerk skirt steak. This is wonderful. Um, and then as far as meat that I like to smoke, I would say my absolute favorite is brisket probably because it's Mm -hmm. the toughest, uh, to nail. And so you feel really good if you nail a brisket, because even if you do the same thing, like two times in a row, just depending on how the brisket is or how your smoke was or the temperature, like it can be either the best thing on earth or it can be really average at best. So I like a good brisket. Um, but I also like doing some like chicken drummies because my kids love chicken drummies. They, they don't eat chicken wings for some reason, which is bizarre, but they Weird. love chicken drummies. Uh, and I've got a big offset smoker where I, I actually uh, out on my farm, I cut down all the wood and I like chop it up and I age it. And then I use that in my smoker. So it pumps out a ton of good smoke. So pretty much anything you put on there is awesome. But like a a nice chicken wing is, is really fun. And I'll use some like national hot seasoning on there. So it's a little spicier Mm -hmm. and uh, that's a good go-to to to pair with a brisket and then maybe some like smoked Brussels sprouts with one tip. If you are a big brisket person, I love taking a whole pack of brisket. And then when you trim it, you trim like the fat off, mm-hmm. but don't throw that away. Put that on your brisk on your smoker for an hour and then take that off and then dice it up. And it's like the best bacon bits you've ever had. So wow. then you can put that into your Brussels sprouts or your asparagus or whatever else you're doing on the side. And it'll just blow people away. And you're not wasting any of your brisket. Yeah. You know, it's funny, Joe, my brother-in-law last Christmas smoked a 17 pound brisket. Mm. We did, I think for eight hours overnight. Mm-hmm. And we did the same thing when we trimmed it, we took yeah. the, we, we kept it in strips yeah, and dice exactly. them up, but we put yep. them on the grate and then that was yep. kind of a little appetizer. I mean, yeah, you know, cut it up after it was cooked yeah. and throw it on there. And, oh, it was amazing. We're, um, both of my brother-in-laws and Scott and I have smoked a couple of things on his smoker. Scott has an electric smoker. My brother-in-law mm-hmm. has a Traeger offset nice. and the other one mm-hmm. has a Kamado Joe. Nice. And we've done everything from you know, brisket, rack of lamb, you know, pork ribs, mm, beef ribs, yeah. whole chicken, um, salmon. My One of my brother-in-law owns his own uh, uh, tackle company. He lives up in mm. Michigan, fishes all the time. So he'll get some salmon and some walleye nice. and, and yeah, uh, yeah. lake trout. It's just, it's a big hobby of mine. Scott's <laughs> yeah. getting into it too. I'm, I'm just getting hungry just talking about it. But I've, I know. I've, I've seen your, your videos on uh, Twitter before, and I've always been dying to ask you about that because it's mm. just so interesting. Because you're right, a brisket, there's so many little variables Mm-hmm. And it could either mess it up and some of it's yep. out of your control. It could be a bad cut yeah. of meat or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but my favorite steak is a tomahawk ribeye. That is nice. my, my yeah. favorite. So. Yeah, th- those are hard to beat. W- one thing I'll say too, um, it's kind of a specialty because it's hard to get unless you like, I, I, we just slaughtered a steer that we raised on my own farm. Um, so we had the butcher come and I was like, Here, this is what I want, but it's hard to find like a long beef rib bone mm-hmm. unless you go to like, a butcher or or you do it yourself. And if you smoke one of those, that is, is like next level stuff because (laughs) it's kind of got the fattiness of a brisket. So you kind of got to treat it like a brisket, but when it's done, that everything is so nicely caramelized and you can just slide that bone out and then you can either slice it thin like a brisket and everybody loves it. Or you can make them into big, like dinosaur bone uh, (laughs) ribs, which is really fun. Um, But another thing to do with the brisket trimmings is once you smoke it in those big strips, like you said, putting them in Brussels sprouts is like probably my Mm -hmm. favorite, but my second favorite, my buddy makes like a, a multi beans, like, um, smoked beans where he'll Mm -hmm. put it 
uh, I don't even know what type of beans he puts in there, but he puts it on the smoker. So they get smoked and then he takes that brisket trimming and then dices it up for into little pieces and puts it into that like seven bean, uh, yeah, yeah. Baked beans. And it is unbelievable. You need at least eight beers extra with how amazing <laughs> and fatty that is. Oh man. That's a, that's a good meal to have on a cool fall day watching oh. some football right there. Yeah, baby. That's yeah. right there. My dad, uh, when he came down, I was living in Tampa at the time before I moved to, back to Cleveland, and I made him a couple. Uh, I made him one tomahawk ribeye that he and I shared, and I, I made one for my mom and my wife mm. and my sister who visited. And I just when I cut the bone right off, I just gave it to him as like a dinosaur bone. Here you go, Dad. And my dad just like kind of <laughs> Fred Flintstone, right? Yeah, That's Fred right. Flintstone. It was fantastic, oh, but uh, uh, awesome there. Well, Joe, we're gonna do one quick little segment here. Is rapid fire. Okay. Um, there will be quick questions. Mm-hmm. They're gonna be questions football related, some stuff in Cleveland. First, you know, words uh, that come to your mind. Okay. Throw them out there. They're really quick. They're fun questions, and then we'll let mm-hmm. you go. Great. Uh, Scott, you want to start this off? I'll start it off. All right. Hardest opposing lineman you ever had to block. Dwight Freeney. Top three favorite Browns teammates. Uh, Alex Mack, Josh McCown, and Joel Batonio. And Joel Batonio was on that shirt you were wearing the day when I interviewed you. That's right. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) There's many more, of course. but Right, sure. The the first three that came to mind. Favorite stadium and, and or city to play in outside of Cleveland. Um, believe it or not, actually Lambeau field, but other than Lambeau field, cause that's where I grew up. And I mm-hmm. think the history of that place is a little bit better than any place else in the NFL, but I actually love playing in Pittsburgh because I love going into a hostile environment where it feels like it's us 53 against the world. You, you got the most smack talk from the fans that were behind you. I love the playing surface. I thought it was cool right there on the edge of those rivers. And, mm-hmm. uh, it was outside of Lambeau. That was my next favorite. What was your pregame meal and superstition if you had one? No superstition other than I just like to eat the same thing. So I kind of knew how my body was going to handle it. Like I didn't want to try anything <laughs> goofy and then go do yoga on a cruise ship and like have the upset stomach going into uh. the game. So uh, <laughs> in the morning I would eat um, scrambled eggs or no, I'd eat an omelet. I would eat like chocolate chip pancakes with syrup and butter. Um, and then I would eat bacon and then i would get like a big smoothie to go that had um some like yogurt and it would have like berries and some seeds in it and that usually held me over pretty well till halftime and then at halftime i'd eat like a couple peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and some oranges for (laughs) a little bit more energy you have a favorite restaurant in cleveland that um that you maybe go to now when you come back into town or Mm -hmm. one that you went when you uh when you were a player Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always tell people that the best part about Cleveland is the restaurant scene because it's so underrated and there's so many great options. It's such a melting pot uh, of awesome people. And that really translates into great options for eating out. And Fahrenheit by uh, Rocco Whalen was always Mm -hmm. that one like go to spot for me and my wife. Um, But like I said, town hall, like there's numerous fantastic places to get something to eat no matter what you want cleveland's got it all right four more and then we'll be done favorite tv show you're streaming right now man i got into this weird like uh not watching tv at night just going to bed thing which has been really good for me but it's been bad for my streaming um so i'm ashamed to say that i have not watched the original top gun in its entirety and everyone's saying how great the sequel is so i keep telling my wife we need to just like block out a couple hours when the kids go to bed and watch like both of them, because I feel like I'm definitely missing out as awesome as everybody tells me that, that they are most memorable Browns memory or game. So playing in that snowball game, my rookie year against Buffalo, where we went into the locker room after warmups and it wasn't snowing and we came out like 10 minutes later and there was like three inches of snow on the ground. It, it all of a sudden in my mind, it felt like it was Christmas morning and I'd gone outside and I was ready to go make snowmen with the neighbors after opening up presents. Like it just had that like childlike joy to the game. And we ended up winning eight to zero Phil Dawson, the great Phil Dawson, two field goal kicks that like went up in the air and turned into flying saucers and, and hovered and somehow like snuck through the goalpost in 40 mile an hour winds and seven inches mm-hmm. of snow. Um, and then we got a safety and it was just a memorable moment. One of the coolest scenes that I've ever played in. 
Bill Dawson said the same thing. That was his favorite Browns mm-hmm. memory really? as well. That's right. He did yeah, mention well, that. Yeah. He was the hero. So I'm not surprised about that. <laughs> <laughs> favorite Browns coach you played for? Um, I would say Kyle Shanahan. He was not the head coach, but he was the offensive mm-hmm. coordinator. And I remember after that season we had with him thinking, because he ended up deciding to leave because he had some disagreements. I remember, remember thinking like, man, we should just make him the head coach. <laughs> and sure enough, a year later, they fired Mike Pettin. And uh, and now Kyle's gone on to be a great head coach out in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, so he just, he connected with players so well. Mm-hmm. He was also a master of what he wanted to teach. So he could stand up in front of the offense and he knew the details of everybody's position. It commanded respect. And I think he built confidence in all the players going into those games that he wasn't asking them to do anything they couldn't do. And if everybody did what he was asking, you were going to have a great offensive output and win the game. Final question. Do the Browns win the Super Bowl in the next five years, given what you're seeing right now? No doubt. <laughs> you didn't hesitate one bit there, Joe. No way, man. They they got a great front office. They've got a great coaching staff. And they've got the team loaded top to bottom with quality young players. They got a five-year window that they could win at any point in the next five years. Wow. And a bonus question real quick. Give me a player in training camp now as the preseason has ended, as we head into week one, that we're not talking about that we should be talking about. Mm. Good mm. question. Mm. I would say let's talk a little bit about David and Joku. Um, I know he's one of the highest paid tight ends in the NFL, and he's obviously somebody that's garnered a lot of conversation. But being around training camp this year, the conversation's all been about great defense, great secondary. Who are the receivers that are going to step up, the young guys? Great running game. But really, when you look at Jacoby Brissett and what he wants to do, we talked to him before the last preseason game. He said, the most important thing for me in training camp in this last preseason game is to continue to build that rapport with the tight ends because those are the guys that I'm probably going to look to the most. So I expect a huge season out of David with as much as Jacoby loves hitting those tight ends and with as much as the relationship has been built between uh, Jacoby and David. And I think he's going to be a big factor in the success of this offense early in the season. Yeah. And the season's just right around the corner, a big game week one down in Carolina. Will you be down there in Charlotte? I will not be down in Charlotte. I'm actually going to be in Cleveland that weekend, which is funny, but the, one of our good friends is getting married. So we're going to mm-hmm. be there on Saturday and then I'm going to be hunkered down with the fam uh, in our condo in Cleveland, just Nice. Throwing stuff at the TV if it's not going well and <laughs> celebrating with a lot of 73 Kolsch beers from Great Lakes Brewing if things do go well, because that's a big one, as we all know, for a lot of reasons. You, you know, Bernie Kozar does a uh, we tape a Browns pregame show, Orange and Brown Countdown on Fox 8. We just uh, taped one of our episodes yesterday. He told me he doesn't like to use the word must win, but if there's ever a must win in a week <laughs> one, this is it. That's right. Do you, do you kind of agree with that sentiment or is it just any other game? Uh, I think it's a really important game. Like we love saying must win in the media world. It was funny in NFL network. When I did Thursday night football for the last four years, we would have production meetings the night before and we'd go through the questions and stuff like that. And inevitably when like the head honchos were there, when the big time producers were in those meetings, it was always like, why is this a must win? This is a must win. Somebody's got to say it. Like, Everybody loves pushing that because (laughs) it just gives it the feeling of this is a huge game. It may not be a playoff game, but it feels like the season is riding on this game. And it's hard to disagree when you think about, all right, Baker was our quarterback for the last four years. Now he's the starter in Carolina. So obviously there's like a personal rivalry between Cleveland and Carolina and Baker and the team and all those factors going into it. But also like with this team, we don't really know who they are. Like we've seen Mm -hmm. very few of the, premier players play in preseason like the people that were there during training camp saw some really good practices but we also saw some up and down performances during the first three preseason games Jacoby's the quarterback for 11 weeks Mm -hmm. what's he going to look like with his full complement of players we have no idea there's so many guys that we haven't seen playing together and week one is the first time you're going to get that first impression and you know just like they say about first impressions you only get one chance to make a first impression a lot of times it's going to stick with you the entire season so this is where as a fan we get to kind of put our ceiling on expectations for the season and the floor and so I think when it comes to importance of the first game 
the players are are thinking the same thing. They want to see what kind of team they have also. And I think that's why you really want to look good in that first game. Obviously you want to win, but you really, really, really want to look good in that first game for your own confidence as a player. And as a fan, you want to have that expectation and that excitement carry through season, the entire season and, you know, week two, three, Mm -hmm. four, five, and six and so on. Joe, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on our podcast. I know we went a little long, but a lot of great stories and just a lot of great information about uh, the Browns and about your career. And uh, on behalf of everybody, want to thank you very much for joining us here, you know, today and want to wish you guys the best of luck in what you're doing here in the, in the off season with the, uh, you know, with broadcasting and your family and, and good luck smoking meat here as we head into the fall. <laughs> Thanks for having me on guys. I'm going to have to get back to my brisket right now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Joe. And, uh, I'll see you sometime around First Energy Stadium if you're in town for a game. I know you'll be there for opening, home opener, being inducted in the Legends Club. So uh, we cannot thank you enough for taking time out to, to chat with us today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. Well, John, that was fun. I mean, you know, we knew Joe was going to be talkative, which is great. And I mean that in, in a really good way. And, you know, he's just such an eloquent um, – uh, just an eloquent speaker of, of and, and describer of, of, of everything. You know what I mean? I mean, just, just hearing him, he's great on the air talking about the Browns, talking about him, his transitions, just a guy who's really down to earth and keeps everything in perspective, which I think, you know, a lot of us, um, whether you're a, a, a player, whether you're in, in everyday life, perspective is always, is always key. It is. And, you know, he has such a, um, great personality and very versatile in a lot of things that he has to say in so many stories. It's just kind of a, you know, he's just a regular old guy, you know, he's a guy you do want to go have a beer with and smoke some meat with and sit around the fire and chat about whatever, you know, with the, the fish he caught or that workout he's doing or the guy he blocked in that game. Um, You know why Scott fans love him so much in Cleveland is because that's Cleveland fan that, you know, that's that's blue collar and and Mm -hmm. people love that. And that's why they gravitated to Joe. He's so beloved in the city. So, um, I loved his insight on his career, love his insight on the Browns coming up here and, and his hobbies outside as well and his work on his, his massive transformation. Uh, a lot of good stuff there. Um, you know, so much to, to, to really talk about. But I think the, the one thing I, I thought was really funny is, is the, uh, the carbs and the meat and, and the, the, the diet he had to eat when he was playing and his wife's cooking stir fry. You can't do that. I need you got to have some rice and noodles in here. Yeah. I mean, I remember tweeting him a couple of years ago, asking him about it because uh, I like studying nutrition and all this. And, and, um, and I asked how many, how many calories do you take? And yeah, he, he said like six, 7,000 calories. Then I asked him, well, and I, he didn't mention it here, but uh, on, on Twitter, he, he mentioned now he's probably taken in, I mean, he's still a big guy. So he's probably taken in less than half of that. But still, when you're used to doing that, and then all of a sudden you got to shut it down. I mean, I'm sure that was a difficult transition for him. But you know, hey, you know, it's 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 for his health too. I mean, how old was he when he retired? 32, 33. Uh, he retired at the Maybe. ripe age of 33. 33. Okay, and that was five years ago. So he's only 38. So he's in great shape. And uh, you know, it, I've heard a lot about this too. You know, he mentioned yoga. I don't know. My wife does yoga, and um, it's something I that it. I think we all got to to do you know i don't do it nearly as much I, I try to get into it and then of course the when we were on that cruise ship that was a you like uh, how i threw you under the bus there yeah i i, I was kind of hoping you didn't remember that but um but that was kind of a fluke thing yeah don't, the moral of that story is don't eat a full huge breakfast with everything you can think of and then do yoga on a, on a cruise ship in the gulf of mexico <laughs> uh when the when the waves are going like you know whatever they were so but oh, yeah Anyway, yeah, it'd be fun smoking meat with him, having a couple of pops, you know? Absolutely. That's uh, the brisket is always fun to do. Mm-hmm. We, you and yeah. I got to do a brisket. One of I know. Days. I got to yeah, teach you. Especially you before to... it gets cold. Yeah. Those are fun. So big thanks to Joe Thomas yeah. for stopping on the uh, good old Sable Brothers and the Baseline podcast. Uh, hope you guys really enjoyed listening to that. And you can follow us on Twitter. I'm on Scott Sable, F-O-X, the number eight. And John, your Twitter. Follow me, if you'd like, uh, at right. John underscore Sable. And follow the pod at Sable Bros. We like to get some interaction with you guys, mm-hmm. some comments. Uh, if you guys have any uh, requests on some guests, we got mm-hmm. a nice guest list coming up here through the end of the year. We and do. If you have any input there, throw it our way. And be sure, if you haven't already, subscribe to iTunes and Spotify. That mm-hmm. way you get the notifications on your mobile device. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us and join us next time for the next episode of Sable Brothers on the Baseline podcast. <laughs>